Welcome to Truth Seekers, where each week we study God's magnificent and powerful Word, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. Today's study will not be easy because we're going to come face to face with the doctrine of hell. That's what I said, the doctrine of hell. You know, the doctrine of hell is hard. It's uncomfortable and it's easy to cover up, to avoid, uh, or to try to ignore and disbelieve altogether. But the truth is, the doctrine of hell is real. And no matter how hard we try to ignore it or to cover it up, it's not any less real, and um, it's not going away. So we must look at it and be familiar with it, because it's in Scripture. And in today's study, in our study of the parable of the dragnet, we'll come face to face with one of the most vivid teachings by Jesus on the subject of hell. So put your big boy pants on, your big girl pants, and come along as we peer into the pit of hell. Uh, I'd say put on your fireproof pants, but uh, if we're saved, born again, um, and have trusted and believed in Jesus as our Lord, you don't need those pants. So before we get started, uh, because of the nature of the subject in particular, I, I really want to go to the Lord in a short prayer. So if you will join with me, let us pray. Father, thank you for the fact that as believers, we have the hope, the faith, the assurance and uh, the confidence of eternal life in heaven with you forever and ever. Thank you for saving us from the horrors of hell, Lord, from the eternal darkness, the damnation, and the suffering that is there in that horrible, terrible place prepared for the devil and his fallen angels. May today's study cause us to be like the parable of the householder that we'll also look at, Lord, who dispenses your word such that people will come to know you and thereby exchange hell for heaven and eternal life and abundant life uh, through you. May your Holy Spirit uh, now open our eyes, open our ears and our hearts to the truths of your word. We pray these things in the one and only Savior's name, Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for letting me do that. Um, you'll see why I wanted to do that after we get started here. We come to the last two parables of Jesus that are given to us in this, this amazingly really important chapter 13 of the Gospel of Matthew. You know, there are eight of the approximately 40 parables that Jesus gave that are contained in that chapter alone. So it's a very, very important chapter. And there's a good argument that all eight of these uh, parables that we have here in chapter 13 were given rapid fire, one after the other, by our Lord uh, to the large crowds that had find that in verse two, where it talks about the fact that uh, um, there was a large crowd there. Um, many Bible scholars agree because because it, I was looking there because it looks like maybe we went offline. I may have already been chopped off. But, well, key Bibles of Jesus' way of responding um, to the Pharisees who had accused him, if you'll remember, in chapter 12 of Matthew of being an instrument of the devil. That's found over in verse 24 of chapter 12. But by now speaking to them in parables, he's fulfilling prophecy from the Old Testament. But it is also, as we've discussed previously, a form of, uh, judgment upon them for their unbelief. You know, personally, I, I'll even go further. I'll tell you that I believe that the Pharisees, um, I believe that they knew that Jesus was indeed the Messiah, or at least many of them did. They knew that he was a Savior because of what he had done. It couldn't have been done by anybody else. In fact, we kind of get glimpses of that over in chapter 3 of John when Nicodemus comes to see him where he admits, well, we know that you're from God because of the miracles that you do. But I believe uh, their belief was, or their unbelief, their refusal to accept him as the Savior 
and as the Messiah was primarily because of their pride. Their hearts were hardened. And they had refused to acknowledge Jesus as a long-awaited for Messiah and Savior. And I think they were intoxicated with their power, their positions as a legal elite, not legal elite, but religious elite. Uh, they were not only intoxicated with their power and their position, but they were probably greedy, and we see evidence of that in Scripture too, of the people's praise for them uh, wherever they went. They were given the best seats and given honor and the prestige that went with that, and also the money that probably went along with that, uh, being a Pharisee as well. You remember, the Pharisees uh, could really be called politicians, uh, as we would know of them today, because um, under Jewish culture and law at that time, 2,000 years ago, the Pharisees governed the people not only with respect to religious issues, but also with respect to moral and social policies too. They even had the power, if you'll remember, to judge Jewish citizens and to mete out punishment. And uh, all eight of these parables uh, not only had each in and of itself a lesson and a teaching and a truth principle, but all eight, I believe, were linked together, weaving and building an overarching teaching about the new era that Jesus had been telling them about that would soon begin, the church age. You remember the church was a mystery, Scripture tells us, to those that were alive at that time. Uh, you can find that in verse 11 of chapter 13 that we were looking at where he, he says that it's a mystery. And Jesus was teaching and preparing his followers, uh, Christ followers, for what this new time period would be like because it was going to be much different than uh, what they had expected or anticipated. Uh, kind of like, I guess, our covid and our, maybe think about World War I and World War II, about how life was changed because of those incidents. Well, life was getting ready to change uh, for the Christ followers and for the Jews in general, and indeed, ultimately, the whole world. Not only did the Jews expect the Messiah to bring judgment then and now, so to speak, at that time upon the world, and especially for their enemies, uh, at that time it was the hated Romans, but prior to that it had been the Philistines and the Syrians or the Babylonians or the Persians, but that they believed that their Jewish king, the Messiah, uh, who would be an heir of King David, would again rule over the Jews and indeed the world and restore their kingdom to what it once had been. And even Jesus' own disciples, you'll remember, <clears throat> even after being with him for approximately two years by the time we get to chapter 13 here in, in Matthew, um, they thought that as well, that Jesus had told them, uh, in spite uh, of him telling them time and time again, that uh, he was going to have to be uh, abused and uh, would even be murdered, and, uh, but yet that he would, would arise. And they just didn't get it. Uh, we even see that after the crucifixion, that they still didn't quite understand that. And, and we might ask, well, why is that? Well, think about it. It wasn't until Pentecost that uh, the promised counselor that Jesus spoke about in the upper room, the Holy Spirit, came to enlighten them. And so it was then that the Holy Spirit gave them the understanding of all that Jesus had been teaching in the past. Their eyes were open, like the two on the road to Emmaus who their thoughts were open as Jesus uh, put all the Old Testament together with, with what had been going on. But... Uh, Back to chapter 13 and these two final parables in that chapter and the puzzle that I believe that Jesus was putting together for those who had ears to hear. Uh, that's in verse 39 or verse 9 and verse 43 he uses that phrase. In other words, they had hearts to understand. So Jesus here in chapter 13 has strung together these eight parables to teach them about what the kingdom of God would look like and be like until his second coming, until he returned. And he was explaining to them the nature of that kingdom, what it was going to be like, and uh, the power and the influence of it, and how to be included, how to uh, get into it approximately, um, how to appropriate it to themselves, how to, how to get that. Um, and uh, he was told that uh, they were expecting judgment and he told them that judgment would come, but it would be at the end of this age, at the end of this time period. 
and that would be a judgment of damnation and hell and darkness for those who didn't trust him or don't trust him upon his work on the cross for their redemption, which is a fancy word for saying salvation that was freely offered by Jesus. And on the other hand, the eternal life that was offered to those who had believed and followed Jesus. And I think of these eight parables as being, if you will, like railroad ties in a railroad track that hold up the two tracks. Just think about eight railroad ties there. And on top of them are these two steel rails that leads to the kingdom of God, to life abundant here on earth and life eternal and forever on the other side of our physical uh, life and on the other side of uh, death. And those who don't follow Christ Jesus and the way, according to John 14, 6, will find their spiritual lives derailed like these Pharisees were derailed because of pride. Um, and if pride doesn't derail them or didn't derail them or derail us, it will probably be their love for the world that we live in. You remember 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, tells us and warns us not to fall in love with the world or the things of the world. Um, but those are all tools of Satan, the devil, that he uses to successfully, I might add, uh, lead us, uh, lead the multitude, the masses, the most of the people to doom and hell. Well, we're going to see that in full living color today. We'll even get a faint whiff, in a sense, uh, of the smoke from hell in its fiery pit. So let's get to the these two tiny parables that we've uh, grown so accustomed to realizing that even though these parables are short, in length, they do carry a powerful punch, and these two are no exception. Uh, the power, the parable of the dragnet, and of the and of the householder, and uh, that might be referred to in, in the if you have an NIV, the householder, or if you have an NSAB, the household, and we'll get into that in a minute. But these two power-packed, show-stopping or ending, if you will, parables uh, are in verses 47 to 52 six verses in chapter 13. So I'm going to read those to us. So listen up. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet cast into the sea and gathering fish of every kind. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach and they sat down and gathered the good fish into containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 51, Have you understood all these things? And they said to him, Yes. And Jesus said to them, Therefore every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of the household who brings out his treasure things new and old. Well, now before we unpack these two parables, let me make clear what Jesus is teaching, I believe, here, and what we're looking at as we break down and discuss these things. I want to get that out front so you can keep your eyes focused and see if you can see this as, as we talk about this. But the, temple, the, the, the teaching, I believe, is simple and forthright. Basically, these they illustrate and picture for us the separation at the end times of the unbelievers from the believers, Christ followers, and the impending judgment that awaits unbelievers. And that's the parable of the dragnet. And, the, and then you have in the parable of the, the weighty responsibility upon us as believers to dispense the word of God and its saving power. This time period, the church age, until Jesus' return. My phone keeps showing that uh, we keep getting bumped off, so I don't know whether I'm live or not, but we'll, we'll continue and see what happens. So let's take a... This parable is a scary and frightening warning to us about what happens when the unsaved, those not born again, are separated for judgment at the end. Describing that would have been very familiar to all of his audience, the large crowds. It's a fishing story, a catch, a huge catch. And remember, this was taking place along the 
seaside is the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And not only were people very familiar with the fishing practices there, but his disciples knew uh, that they would have understand it. They were especially uh, familiar with this because at least a third of the disciples made their living from fishing. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, all four of them, when they were called, they were out fishing. And I think there were some other apostles or disciples that uh, were also in the fishing industry, maybe Bartholomew and some others. But John MacArthur points out in his co commentary that there were and still are today three basic ways of fishing in the Sea of Galilee. Um, the first was the simple one that we might understand. You used a pole and a fishing line and a hook, um, and you used it to catch one fish at a time. And remember, that's the kind of fishing that over in Maxis. And he told Peter and to go find a fish, and in the fish's mouth he would find uh, the two drachma that he would need. The second type of fishing that would have been familiar to the audience would have been a one, been one involving a small net that the fishermen carried over their shoulders. And maybe we'd like to think of it as um, like a cowboy roping a steer or something along that line, uh, where they would fling that net around and cast it out into the water when they'd see a school of fish. They might do that you know, from the shore uh, in the shallow water, or they might do it even from the boat. Um, but the idea was it had some weights on it, and when the net was thrown out, it would cover a series of, of the fish, and they could pull a line and pull it together, and then they would drag those fish in. It'd be more than one fish, but it wouldn't be a huge amount, but it was a way of gathering fish. And if you watch, in the, watch the show The Chosen, I think that's what you see several times in those episodes of when Peter and his brother and some others are fishing that way with those nets that they swing around like a lariat rope. Well, the third type of fishing uh, described um, is the one that I think is applicable here, and it's referred to as the dragnet. And it was huge. Uh, we might think of it around here in Oklahoma, instead of a dragnet, you might call it a seine, S-E-I-N-E, -E, uh, where, where basically they drug this net along the bottom of the lake or the sea, either between two boats or sometimes one end would be affixed to something on the shore and the fishermen would then sweep the perimeter using it. And think about that. If you use that method with this huge net, in fact, John MacArthur said his research showed that some of those nets could be up to half a mile long. And think about that. If you swept from the surface clear to the bottom, had weights in the bottom and floats in the surface and you swept that along the bottom, what would you catch? Well, you'd catch everything. You'd catch fish. You'd catch desirable fish, undesirable fish. Uh, you'd catch turtles, uh, snakes possibly. Might even drag up a few bottles or whatever debris might be on the bottom. But you get the big picture, if you will, is that um, you're going to catch a lot of stuff there. Nothing could escape. And do you see the symbolism there? that when the dragnet is cast and dragged in at the end of the age, everything will be caught up in it. And then when it was full, it would be dragged up on the shore and the fishermen would gather the good and throw away the bad. Again, you get the picture? This is the method that Jesus has just described to his audience, uh, the huge crowd of people that would have included not only the Pharisees, but certainly the apostles, and everyone in between, a lot of ordinary and common Jews as well. So I want to reread verses 48 and uh, 49 in particular, uh, because I want us to take a look at the takeaway here. Verses 48 and 49. And when it was filled, they drew it up on the beach, and they sat down and gathered the good fish in containers, but the bad they threw away. So it will be at the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous. Now this is where you can see the progression of the parables, can't you? Think about the eight parables that we've looked at or the six prior to today. Uh, they come in couplets. Remember several weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the soils. Some of you know it as the parable of the sower. 
Uh, and the idea there was that um, there would be a small number, just like the four soils, only one soil had a heart to believe. And the idea was is that only a small number would come to believe and follow Christ. And these are parallel to the good fish in this parable, the righteous, not because of what they did, but because what Jesus did for them on the cross and that they had appropriated Jesus' righteousness to themselves by following Jesus and becoming born-again believers. And then you remember the second parable that we looked at with the parable of the soils was the parable of the wheat and tares. And what was the takeaway on that parable? Well, during this era, what Jesus is describing, this is what the kingdom is going to look like from after the crucifixion, the ascension, until his second coming, is during this era that we'd, they'd be entering and in which you and I are in, the time period that we know as the church age, is that believers and non-believers would live alongside each other. And that's what, in fact, you get that. I'm going to turn back over to the Proverbs or the parable of the uh, wheat and tares. I'm going to look at verses uh, 39 to 41. And he says a very similar thing. He says, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. See, we've had that in this parable. So just as the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so it shall be at the end of the age. The son of man will send his angels and they will come or they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness. So these two, this parable that we're studying today, the parable of the dragnet and those first two parables we studied are interconnected. In fact, I want to take just a second to read John MacArthur's commentary, a part of it, because it was so powerful. He says, uh, this is John MacArthur, In his interpretation of the parable of the wheat and tares, Jesus stated the same truth as he gives here. At the end of the age, angels will come forth and will take out the wicked from among the righteous. I just read those two verses to you. It says, During this present era, which is the church age, God permits unbelief and unrighteousness, but the time is coming when his toleration will end as his judgment begin. The first phase of the judgment will be the separation of the wicked from among the righteous, the tares from among the wheat. The dragnet of God's judgment moves silently through the sea of mankind and draws all men to the shores of eternity for final separation to their ultimate destiny. destiny. Believers to eternal life and unbelievers to damnation. In fact, I want to go on I know we're maybe running a little bit longer than normal, but I want to read another paragraph that he said that I think really catches this picture. He says, Men move about within the net as if they were forever free. It may touch them from time to time, as it were, startling them, but they quickly swim away thinking they've escaped, not realizing that they're completely and inescapably encompassed in God's sovereign plan. The invisible web of God's judgment encroaches on every human being just as that of the dragnet encroaches on the fish. Most men do not perceive the kingdom, and they do not see God working in the world. They may be briefly moved by the grace of the gospel or frightened by the threat of judgment, but they soon return to their old ways of thinking and living, oblivious to the things of eternity. But when man's day is over and Christ returns to set up his glorious kingdom, then judgment will come. And isn't it interesting that Jesus here focuses on specifically what's going to happen to unbelievers and is almost silent to the bliss of eternal life that awaits believers. And that's because I believe Jesus' own, his followers, his apostles, they didn't need more than knowing Christ and following him. That was enough. They trusted him for what awaited them in the future. And you and I can as well, uh, and down the road. In uh, fact, you know, Paul was limited on what he was allowed to tell us. You know, he went to the third heaven. He was allowed to see what heaven will be like. And he was told that he was not to tell what he saw. It was, it was not to be revealed at that time. But we can trust the Lord. But that's it, here's what's going on. He's directing these comments towards unbelievers as a warning as to what awaits them if they don't believe and follow him. And remember, it's often uh, pointed out, Jesus spent a whole lot more time speaking of hell than heaven. And what do you think that was? Well, I have a, several thoughts, and I have some scriptures I want to share with you. First of all, I want us to remember that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 
over in Ezekiel 18.23. Let me turn there real quick if I can find it. 18.23. It says, sorry for that, I should have had that pulled up. 18.23, it says, Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than he should rather than he should turn from his ways and live. So he's telling us that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. He wants all men to be saved. In fact, if we were to go to 2 Peter 3, 9, or 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, we'd find that very thing, that he desires that no one perishes, that everyone come to the knowledge of salvation. And think about what Jesus did when he entered Jerusalem that week of the Passover. It says, you know, they were throwing palm leaves out for him. He rode the donkey, and it looked like he was being crowned as the Messiah. Yet he knew that in just a few days, the crowd would turn on him, and they'd hang him on a cross, and they'd reject him as the Messiah. And it says that he wept over Jerusalem because he had hoped that they would receive him and not reject him. Um, but he, he wept because people wouldn't come to him and be saved. We find that over in Luke 19, verse 41. Another scripture I want to share with you that I think that Jesus is the reason he's giving this very hard parable for his hearers and for us is that you know hell wasn't prepared for man rather it was prepared for the devil and the fallen angels the demons but that's where unsaved people will go and we find that over in Matthew 25 41 in fact let me just turn to that since I'm being a little slow tonight uh, listen to Matthew 25, 41. He says, Then he will also say to those on his left, Depart from me, accursed ones, into eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. So why did Jesus spend so much time talking about hell? Is because he loves us. And he wants, he doesn't want us to go there. Well, let's go back to chapter 13. Look at verse 50. I'm going to include verse 49 too. He says, so it will be at the end of the ages, or the end of the age, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous, verse 50, and will throw them into the furnace of fire in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <laughs> over and over again, Jesus warns about the horrors of hell, and he pleads with us to avoid it by coming to him for salvation. You know, hell is a terrible place, we're told. Uh, we don't want to go there. Uh, some have questioned why Jesus spoke so much about it. Well, what if he hadn't and, it's, and, it, and had assigned that bad news to the prophets or the apostles? Here's what I think we'd have probably done. We would have said something like, well, Jesus didn't say that, uh, so I don't believe it. But we don't have any excuse because Jesus talks about hell over and over. So we don't have any defense. Jesus tells us all about it in its unimaginable uh, terms. Utter darkness, like a temple uh, that uh, one we've that we know the truth of salvation. Once we know the truth of salvation, basically what it's telling us here, and that we know its its power and its influence this, of salvation, the Word of God. Um, you remember, that's what the next two parables that we studied were, the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. What was the teaching there? That what would start out small would grow great and be large. It would start small, it would grow large. And that it's worth, it's invaluable. That's what last two parables were last week, the, the parable of the treasure hidden in the field and also the parable of the pearl of great price, the great value. The teaching there was give up everything you have in order to get it, the kingdom of God. Believe and be saved. Then, in this parable of the householder, Jesus is teaching it, that once we've given up everything we have to get that invaluable, priceless thing, the kingdom of God, to gain salvation, that we're then, we have a duty to dispense the truth, to dispense the gospel, to dispense the kingdom knowledge that we have, uh, the death, the burial, and resurrection of Christ Jesus to everyone. Just like the head of the household in those days would do, he would dispense food and shelter and clothing and comfort and protection 
to those that were within his household, uh, those necessities of life. That's the attitude that we're going to have for those that are lost, those that are the unbelievers that live amongst us, or to share the gospel, or to share salvation with them. And he does it, I want you to notice, and we won't go too deep into this, but he does it by carefully giving out the householder did the old and the new together. Because some of those items would be perishable, wouldn't they? Food, clothing, it would have a shelf life or a use life. And he's saying so he would dole out both. What he's teaching us there is that we're to know not only the New Testament, but we're to know the Old Testament. Put those things together and we're to teach that. And what is it that they say? The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And that's what we have here. Jesus is telling his apostles, telling his Christ followers that they are to be like the householder and dispense both the Old and the New Testament together that leads to salvation. So we need to mature as believers once we have come to know God and to understand his word. We're, we're to grow in his word and to teach the truths of the gospel and salvation. We're to share it, we're to teach it, and we therefore must know it. And that's what we're doing here today, you and me, as we're learning, we're studying the word of God together. And I, ha I have to tell you that I probably get more out of this than you do uh, as I prepare these each week. Well, uh, let's stop for there, there for now. Um, next week we'll come back. I'll have a different study. It won't be quite as heavy, I don't think. We'll, we'll find something next week to look at it that'll be fun to talk about and light to study, but very meaningful. So in the meantime, be in God, be in his word. Remember, it'll prosper you and it will give you peace and joy and believe in Jesus and walk with him. May God's abundant blessings be upon you always. Until next time, good day.